This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is John Mackey, the co-founder and former CEO of Whole Foods, who's just released his memoir, The Whole Story, Adventures in Love, Life, and Capitalism. As befits the entrepreneur who revolutionized grocery shopping from a grim, pragmatic necessity into an exciting, multi-sensory adventure, Mackey's story is far from conventional, and we talk frankly about the failures, successes, and psychedelics he encountered while reshaping how Americans think about food, fitness, and free enterprise. Here is The Reason Interview with John Mackey. John Mackey, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me back, Nick. You, uh, you are the author of the new book, The Whole Story, Adventures in Love, Life, and Capitalism. It's a personal memoir, a spiritual memoir, a business memoir. I want to start with the subtitle, Adventures in Love, Life, I think everybody's with you, and then Capitalism. People don't think about love and capitalism together. Can you talk about how you connect love, life, and capitalism? That's one reason I put them together, to juxtapose them together, because to me, there's no contradiction. To me, capitalism is um, the greatest, along with the enlightenment values and science and reason, capitalism's the responsible, those together are responsible for the great enrichment of humanity, the great progress humanity's made in the last 200 years. How do you define capitalism loosely? I mean, not technically, but when... I, I mean, yes. Uh, I define capitalism as the means of production are privately owned, and entrepreneurs and businesses have uh, a larger degree of economic freedom. So pre-capitalism, you had very highly regulated local economies. You had guilds. You, you couldn't do things. You could. You might even not. You couldn't start businesses. You had to do what your father did, and, and it was very constrained. Not really. Con- and and then in a socialistic, uh, non-capitalism, kind of a similar thing. Um, entrepreneurs are not free to create. They're not free to innovate. They're not free to trade. So in a capitalistic, you can. You have more. It's always a matter of degree, right? So there's not the perfect capitalistic example, but um, it's kind of like I know it when I see it. I mean, entrepreneurs can start up businesses. They can, we can trade with other countries. We can trade uh, innovations permitted, crea- creativity is permitted, competition is there. You don't have sort of this crony uh, situation you might have in other countries where only a few businesses that are favored uh, are able to actually operate. So uh, businesses can fail. No one's too big to fail. You can fail, and uh, it, it, that's the way capitalism works. It works with constant competition, creative destruction. Um, it's free markets. It's free, mar- it's free trade. It's just got a heavy element of just leaving people to trade. with. It's the natural state. People will, are naturally trade with each other. They create and trade with each other if they're allowed to. So capitalism allows it. Capitalism has a bad rap right, or a bad reputation from a lot of people. But I used to, uh, you know, I can remember this going back 20, 25 years, um, when people would be like, capitalism is bad, I would point to or sometimes even drag people into Whole Foods and say, look, this is what capitalism is. Um, And your Whole Foods, the company you co-founded and then brought to a giant, you know, what you sold it to Amazon a few years ago for $14.7 billion dollars. 13.7 13.7 is generally the number, which I happen to like that number because it, supposedly that's the age of the universe. 13.7 <laughs> billion years. So we got one dollar. You got out. One dollar yeah. for every age of the universe. All right. <laughs> so, um, but you know, you go in there and it's, it's this glorious riot of all kinds of different stuff, things that you don't, you don't even know what they are or whether or not you might like them or not. So it's, it's an interesting di- discovery place. It looks great. It smells great. Why does capitalism have such a bad rap? That's it's a good question. It's it's kind of a complex question. Um, I think there because I think there's multi factors. You can't just reduce it down to one or two things. Um, I think it has a bad rap because for it is the very thing that makes its strength upsets people. It changes things, and that makes that scares people. I mean, a great example. I mean, look how beneficial something like AI can be for humanity, and yet 
people you got all this dystopian AI apocalypse is coming and you know the Terminator and people are just scared and it's changing and and so capitalism disrupts the status quo mm -hmm. uh, power relationships change so in the day when, when capitalism was first beginning you know in the Industrial Revolution and really beginning to take off it really interfered with um, the power relationships that you had between the aristocrats the royalty all of a sudden you had these upstarts these business people becoming wealthy and who did they think they were so it it disrupts things it changes things that's the main and primary reason and it continues to do that so like you take globalization for example a great boon to humanity i mean it's created uh, massive prosperity around the world just being able to trade with each other and yet you know there you could argue both political parties in the United States are sort of anti-globalism now, even though it's we've been such beneficiaries from it. Why? Because some people, some people don't benefit from it, and they are then they become angry and they they tr lobby to prevent this type of thing from occurring. What, you know, one of the knocks is that uh, well, you know, and this is a Marxist critique. Capitalism is great for people like you, people who can sell a company for billions of dollars, but you get all that money from the poor. Does, has capitalism helped the poor or has it kept them in their place? Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the false wraps that you have on capitalism is because that mindset sees it as, this sees competition in a zero-sum type of um, uh, uh, structure, that if someone's gaining, someone else is losing. If Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or Steve Jobs becomes a billionaire, well, they're just greedy. They just took a bigger piece of the pie. And how, if we could just take that money, if you listen to somebody like AOC, if you just took that money and redistributed it, we could create a paradise. Yeah. Not understanding that they didn't steal the money. They created more value for people who voluntarily exchanged. And through that creation of more value, they became wealthy. So, um, and then, of course, the money generally gets reinvested into other businesses, and, and that creates yeah, this upward you spiral. Steal, uh, you know, it's funny. When people talk about uh, billionaires being evil, they never say, well, you know, Putin is a billionaire, and he stole his money from his people. But I'm not sure that Jeff Bezos or you have ever stolen any money from me. I mean, did you? how did you make your money? Was it through expropriation, or was it – how did you do it? We sold – natural and organic foods to people who wanted to buy them. They had plenty of competition. They didn't have to buy it from Whole Foods. They could buy it from Trader Joe's or Kroger or Walmart. I mean, there's a variety of different people. And we have to compete with those other retailers to provide higher quality, better service, competitive prices, better store ambiance, convenience. There's all kinds of factors that go up in the decision for someone to trade with you. One of the, uh, I mean, the great parts of the book is when you're describing the very beginnings of Whole Foods, and it, it was originally called Safer Way. Right. And you started in Austin in the in the early... 1978. Okay. Um, so where did Safer Way come from? Where'd the name come from? Yeah, where'd the name come from and the, the urge to create a natural food And by the store. way, Safer Way also will illustrate this capitalism argument a little bit and make a good point. So... We started, my girlfriend Renee and I started Safer Way. I'd, we'd been living in this vegetarian co-op. We were both vegetarians. I went to work for a small natural food store. And uh, I remember coming home to the co-op one day and saying to Renee, you know, I, 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 why don't we create our own store? And she thought it was a good idea. Cool, Mac man, let's do it. And so we did. And we raised $45,000 and we, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't, I was 24 at that time. Renee was 20. We didn't have any business experience. I never studied business. I never took any business classes. Um, but what we had was idealism and energy. So the first Safer Way, it was in a big Victorian house, not on a commercial street. It was zoned for commercial, but that was mostly not for retail. It was for lawyers, really, and uh, the professional class. And it's not named people even lived around there at this point. So... But it was a beautiful house, and we thought it'd be cool to be in this residential street. And Safer Way was also very pure. It was, it was a vegetarian store. We didn't really sell beer and wine. We didn't really sell sugar. We didn't really sell white flour. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't Are really you racist we didn't against even white flour? We didn't, What's the problem with white flour? Well, we didn't sell coffee either. Okay. So we, were, we discriminated on, on various ways. And, and the thing about Safer Way that I like to say is that it also wasn't a successful business. 
We raised $45,000. We lost $23,000 in the first year. And you just flash forward a little bit. Uh, we end up merging with another store, relocating out of Safer Way, and began to sell those things that we weren't selling at Safer Way. They're still selling foods without artificial ingredients, flavorings, colorings, preservatives, still focused on produce, fresh produce. But we began to sell meat and seafood and chicken, and we began to sell coffee and, and beer and wine. And we got on to a main you know, commercial yeah. street, and we got a bigger storefront. And that first, and we changed the name to Whole Foods Market. That mm-hmm. first Whole Foods Market, which opened in September 1980, within six months was the highest volume natural food store in the United States, based on all the research. That we and did. this is at a time when, you know, kind of natural mm-hmm. food uh, types of stuff, that was, I mean, it was happening. It had been growing it since. It was just a bunch of hippies doing yeah. it. So, um, you know, what gave you the sense that this was, I mean, did you go into it saying, this is the market I want to build, or it's just this was a reflection and an expression of what you believe? Well, initially, that, that's why that's the point. Initially, Safer Way represented what the way Renee and I wanted to eat. But the market rejected us. That was, we were going to fail. If we didn't change our product mix, we could have kept our, our, our perfection ideals, but then we weren't meeting the marketplace where we found it. And so, but once we changed our product mix and met the market where it wanted to be, we became fabulously successful. So people began to trade with us. And the the wealth that was created for Safer Way was based on this voluntary exchange for mutual gain. They were gaining. They had alternatives in the marketplace. And this is what people do not understand. Because if you think about the, the metaphors people do to think about competition, for example, it's in sports, there's... There's a winner and lots of losers, but there is no upward flow. There's not a win-win-win. The incredible thing people do not understand about business or capitalism is that it's you have all these different constituencies that are trading with the business. That you know today we think of them as stakeholders, which is a word that we can get back to later. Right. But that just means they have a stake in the business. So a business creates value for customers. Um, if it doesn't, the business will fail. That's why the ultimate purpose of any business will come down to some type of value creation for customers. Doctors create value for customers. Their customers are patients. Their purpose is not to make as much money as possible. It's to help heal people. Teachers uh, teach. Engineers construct things. Architects design things. They're all value creators, and they're trading in the marketplace. I noticed you left journalists out of that, but you know we'll let that go. Journalist. They help people to understand things better or obfuscate some things. And, uh, but no one is forced to read anybody else. If they uh, don't like what they're writing, that is they don't have to read it. No matter how hard you try. They can't yes, exactly. You cannot force people yeah. to read your stuff. You uh, actually have to write stuff that's interesting. Yeah. Or you go out of business. Well, um, you know, in- so it's important to understand yeah. that customers are benefiting, but then you have to employ people to serve the customers. Those are your at Whole Foods team members, employees. They're not forced to work for the company. They, they, and oftentimes they find a better job, they take it. But a good company will provide opportunities for people to grow, to, to get pay increases, to become, get more responsibility. So that's another voluntary exchange right. for mutual gain. The employees are gaining. Then there's all these suppliers. You take a company like Whole Foods Market, we literally have tens of thousands of suppliers. Some local, some from around internationally, all around the world. We deal with maybe a hundred different companies, uh, countries around the world. We're trading with, so um, they're gaining. They're not forced to trade with us either. Mm-hmm. They're benefiting for mu- a mutual benefit. Then investors invest the money, not out of. They're not donating it and get a tax write off. They're expecting to get a return on that investment. That the business will grow and produce profits. That will be their share, and then. A community, a business is part of a community. Think about the value it creates in the communities it's in. It provides all those jobs. Yeah. It, it, it collects taxes. It pays taxes. It pays property taxes. It pays income taxes. Or it, uh, lots of different ways it pays taxes. Um, and then you've got the nonprofit sector, mm-hmm. which business supports through donations and through sponsorships. And at Whole Foods, you created a, uh, a nonprofit that kicked in we, lots of money. Yes, we had three we had three foundations there. So here's this business and it's creating value in all of these different ways and it's it's a win 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 game. It's mm-hmm. good for all of these different stakeholders. It's not a zero sum game. And that's why you make progress in capitalism because the Jeff Bezoses of the world become wealthy because they this is the thing people can't have trouble accepting. They create 
more value than other people. Yeah. Their businesses do. And I'm sorry, but Amazon is a transformative business. I mean, the one click, you can get whatever you want right. within 24 hours or less. That is pretty incredible. Take it, uh, take it back to uh, Safeway and then Whole Foods. How important is the larger context as well? Because businesses don't exist in a vacuum. But, you know, you were in Austin, a town that was more you know, kind of uh, open to oddness or, you know, weirdness, right? <laughs> open you were in a state, uh, Texas, that was more individualistic and more entrepreneurial. You were in a country uh, that, um, you know, had more or less free trade or we got freer trade. I mean, like Whole Foods couldn't have existed if you were in a rigidly zoned area and a place Correct. where everybody around you had to sign off on whether you could open up there. And then yeah. if you couldn't get fruits and vegetables and goods and products from around, you know, from around the world, you'd be kind of screwed. So where does that larger kind of worldview come from? And how do, how do, how do we make sure that's informing how we think about individual businesses or our lives and gains from trade? I don't quite understand the question. How do we get that view spread? Or Yeah, how do we maintain that? Or do you think, uh, I mean, was that an essential part of Whole Foods' success? Yes, it absolutely yeah. was, of course. And then, you know, where did it come from and how do we how do we kind of make sure that things stay loose so that we can actually have this kind of innovation? Well, Whole Foods, Safer Way, 1978, Whole Foods, 1980, if you think about the historical times then, we were moving into a deregulation part of the economy then. Ronald Reagan had just been elected president. Prior to that, Carter had deregulated, say, the airlines. Mm -hmm. um, we, trucking, yeah. Yes, and, we be and we, they began to open up the economy more. And, and then they began to... Countries like China began to be become a little bit more free after Mao died. And you saw this, you saw the opening up. You saw globalization begin to occur. And all you have to do is look at the statistics that you see this incredible upward burst of, of economic activity and prosperity, not for a few people, for the whole planet. In the last 30 years alone, hundreds of millions of people have escaped from <coughs> abject poverty in just two countries, India and China. It's, they're, they're not necessarily strongly capitalistic countries, but before then they were so locked down, they're just giving a little bit of economic freedom, a little bit of entrepreneurs um, allowed those economies to just begin to bloom like mm. beautiful flowers in the desert. So how do we get that spread? I don't necessarily know the answer, but the facts are pretty clear. So I, the, ch the challenge in today's world is that people, confirmation bias is pretty rampant. One of the things that it took me a long time to recognize this, and I'm sad to say that I now believe it is. Very few people will change their minds based on facts, mm. evidence, logic, reasons. We live in, a, in a, an era where the internet itself, if you do a, for example, if you do a Google search on is coffee good for me, you'll, you'll come away reading, oh, my coffee's really the best thing for me. But if you do a similar search that says coffee bad for me, you'll come away, you'll never drink another cup of coffee. Mm. So there's whatever you want, is available on the internet. So when I say confirmation bias, a lot of times I'll make arguments that people can't answer, and then they'll go Google it, and you know, I mean, they'll and they'll get somebody else's answer to it, and all of a sudden they'll be spouting that back to me, even though they don't even understand it. So how do you? It's but it's kind of like you kind of have to almost have faith that in the long run, evidence, facts. Um, uh, the truth will win its way out. And so we have to kind of kind of spread it. It requires courage by certain intellectuals like a Steven Pinker, for example, or Matt Ridley or um, um, Marion Tuppy that to, uh, to, to get their information out about how great prosperity has become in the world and what's the causes of it. I mean, because every generation... We're always just one or two generations away from being in a more controlled uh, situation. And people are, envy is such a powerful human emotion. And people are envious of, of other people gaining prosperity. And they don't think it's fair. So you, this, you have this obsession with social justice and inequality that uh, we should be celebrating the fact that... Uh, People are that pretty much the tide is lifting virtually all boats, <clears throat> but utopia <clears throat> is not really one of our options. We were not, because human nature is both one of the things that socialists have always tried to do is they believe they can create a new human being, one who basically will 
voluntarily, willingly sacrifice for the good of the collective. And it's been tried over and over and over again. I'm actually a student of the history of socialism and a history of utopian thinking because um, I had a lot of it when I was young. Yeah. And what we've learned is, is that uh, no matter how great it is, you look at the history of the kibbutz, for example, they have what they call the third generation problem. You get these very idealistic people that are willing to sacrifice for the collective good, the first generation. Second generation is less into it. By the third generation, they just want to get the hell out and they want to make their way some other part in the larger part of the world. So I just don't think utopia is ever going to be there. And if you don't, you need to study history. You need to see where we came from. And most people aren't aware of it. They take for granted our prosperity, not understanding that it's a delicate creation that can be destroyed fairly easily. Uh, and it doesn't take that long. I mean, look at a country like Venezuela when it, when it, it was it had it had the best oil reserves in the world and it was it had a rising economy and then you got it was the richest country in Latin America yeah, exactly. when and it, and it had a bright bright yeah. future but you got a socialist in there and he pretty much destroyed all that wealth in, in about you, less than 15 years your uh, the book the whole story is in many ways a generational story about America um, your parents were uh, you know raised during the Great Depression World War two. Uh, they're kind of the greatest generation. You, in many ways, are an archetypal baby boomer in that you rebelled against, you know, what your parents wanted for you, and you made your way in the world, and you ended up doing pretty well. Can you talk about your story? Um, you know, how is your experience different than your parents, and what does that have to, you know, kind of tell the world about following your bliss? <clears throat> One of the things that um, I came to I came to realize over time is that. Uh, each generation faces its own set of problems, and it solves for those problems as best it can. And yet, in solving those problems, they create new problems. And then their children have a new set of problems that they have to face. So let's take that and see how that played out over the last you know, 70 or 80 years. So my parents' generation, they were Depression children. They grew up in the Depression, the worst economic crisis America ever faced. They were poor. And then World War II broke out. My dad was 20 years old, and he, you know, he signs up. He gets married. He gets married at age 20, you know. And um, uh, when the war was over, all they could think about was, let's go to a safe place. And so they moved to the suburbs, and let's raise children, and let's have a gardens, and, and let's make this little... We can't make the world a utopia. It's full of craziness. There's communists and, and there's all this war. But we can create a safe place to raise our children. And that's why you had the suburbs just blow up. Besides, you had some technology changes that made that kind of housing more, more available. And, as, and tr transportation, that could, cars and whatnot that could move people about. So uh, that's what they were. And, and so, but they were, my parents, for example, were very duty bound. They wanted to do the right thing. And they were also organization conformist people. They, they conventional. They did not want to stir the pot. They were not rebels. And they created a very prosperous materialistic society. We had the, the great boom of the 50s. And then their children grow up. And we get into the 60s and 70s. And the children are rebelling. And I, they just couldn't understand that. Why would you be doing this? You have no idea. We're, we had this horrible depression, and you guys are. Yeah. You think the money is just going to be there? Yeah, they've it, given, they've teed everything up yeah, for you, exactly. and you're like, uh, I don't want that. My, in my generation, uh, of course, there's obviously huge diversity, but there were a lot of people like me that first we did take the prosperity for granted because that's all we'd ever known. Uh, we didn't know our history, and secondly. We looked at our parents, or I looked at my parents, and I thought, they're living a very shallow life. They're, they're, they're drinking a heavy, heavy quantities of alcohol. They're numbing themselves out. They are, there's, no, there's no inner life. There's no spirituality. I remember I tell the story in the book about when I asked my father about, did you ever think about, you know, think, think God exists? Is there any meaning to life? Is there any purpose to all of this? And he gave me a timeless answer. He said, you know, John, when I was your age, I once spent a whole day thinking about that. Couldn't figure it out. Haven't thought about it since. I mean, and that was, you know, that was my dad, a very practical, reliable guy. And I also want to point out, if it, it, you weren't antagonistic towards your father, he's one of the heroes of the book. I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. My, I was very, yeah. very close. I got very close to my dad because he was my mentor in business, and and he was instrumental. I, I 
Without my, without the background I had, there's no way they could have been successful. Is it, without I him. mean, is it you know a question of Maslow's hierarchy that they were a securing bit. a little bit, yes. you know, more basic needs and didn't have the time or the ability or the interest in going further? I think that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a good model to understand it. And I also, I also, you know, I work from a developmental model, integral theory. I do think consciousness also moves in stages, and so yeah, they gave us a foundation that we could build on, and. And I, I think both of my parents had different interpretations of me. My mother was was just, uh, I tell the story on her deathbed when she was begging me to go back to school to get a degree and make something of myself. Right. And she at saw this me point, as a failure. where were you at, in your career? You well, Whole Foods, 1987 is when she passed, and the last time I talked to her. Um, we were up to about five stores, probably doing about $50 million a year. Uh, making, so, making, uh, yeah, I mean, like you were an enormous success, but your mother was like, I, we weren't an enormous success, but in her mind, I was downwardly mobile. I was a grocer. I could have been a doctor. I could have been a lawyer, but I was just a grocer. That's like, that's like blue collar working. You know, you're in an apron, John. You're out there, you know, serving things and you know, you're smart. I saw all your IQ tests. You could, you could have been a doctor. <laughs> 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 but and, but my father was always supportive yeah. of it. I think because um, well, I think because he didn't exactly live the life he would have lived himself if he could have chosen it. He had he got married young, and got they had children, and he just needed to be the breadwinner. This was an era too where women were we, we were we were in a patriarchy, and women were seen as you know, they stay home and they did the children and had babies and. Uh, took care of the house, and the men went out and worked, and that was uh, that was their reality, and um, kind of how do, you, how do you feel that generational story is going now? Because so you have you know kind of the the greatest generation of the people who grew up during the depression and fought World War II, and then got to live in the peace, but at the cost of being more conformist. Everything was about bigger organizations where you could play your part, and everybody did okay. And you know that's a simplification of it, but then. There's the boomer generation, which is rebellious and individualistic and creates a counterculture. Where are we now in that? Do you feel like younger people, what are the lessons they've learned from, you know, maybe the, uh, the thesis and antithesis of greatest generation and boomer generation? Well, it's interesting, you know, it's not, if you look, if you read the theories behind that, um, uh, that particular model, You've also got the silent generation, which is now in their late 80s and in their 90s, that are beginning to pass from the scene, which means the, the boomers are the, the wise ones. And the, the problem with the, the boomer generation uh, in terms of their worldviews is that they, are, they still have a strong utopian uh, mindset. You might say that there were three directions that the rebels went, three basic directions. There was the social justice movement, uh, and to try to lessen racism and inequality and things like that. There was the environmental movement, which really was a b baby boomer phenomenon. And then there was the new age, alternative spirituality, psychedelics. Um, uh, I was influenced by all three of those, but I, I definitely went the new age route in terms of, of psychedelics and spirituality. Um, what's interesting to me now is that I look at my peers and where they've ended up now that we're in their 60s and 70s, and the the new agers are are um, they're pretty happy. Yeah. They they found some peace <laughs> and you know they had this deeper spiritual connections and whatnot. Uh, and uh, the environmentalists are th are convinced we're doomed. And uh, I mean, the, the Gaia is angry, and we don't know what's going to happen. And the social justice. People are really angry, right. really angry. Even as most of their goals have most been of their goals have been met, but met, yeah. but, but re we're not in utopia yet. Yeah, and I think that desire for utopia is a uh, not having some realism is very difficult. You have to be able to reconcile with the facts, the way things are, and with human nature. Right. So, um, but moving on on just this thesis a little bit. So, because you asked, you know, like, where are we heading? And we have a generation that's coming up today that are. Very different. They're trying. I always tell the younger generation when I talk to them, it's like, hey, my generation did a pretty good job. We solved a lot of problems. Your turn. Time for you to solve some problems. And uh, everybody, every generation's angry. They feel like, you know, it should have been better. Well, now it's your turn. Stop being a victim. Make it better. Take responsibility. And so 
how they're going and how and what they're going to do, it's really hard to say. Uh, of course, my fear is is that they're, the anti-capitalist movement's going to get control of everything, and we're going to kill where, where the golden the, goose. Where does the anti-capitalist movement come from? If you know, I, and I obviously agree with you in broad strokes that you know the world is very wealthy now. You know, more than half of people around the globe live at middle class or higher levels, according to Brookings Institution. I mean, something radical has transformed over the past seventy years, and yet people seem more angry at capitalism the more that it gives up. Capitalism is a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. It is blamed for anything that's wrong is blamed on capitalism. Uh, Anything that deviates from my utopian desires, it's got to be capitalism's fault. They don't compare capitalism to socialism, real socialism. They compare it to an idea in their minds Mm -hmm. of a socialism that's never existed before. This time it'll be different. I don't know. They're not teaching. They're not teaching accurate history any longer, and they're not. They're, that's one of the problems. And the intellectuals, as I've told you in the mm-hmm. past, which upsets people every time I say this, but intellectuals don't like business. Mm-hmm. Not every intellectual, but in general, yeah. the intellectual class doesn't like business people. They don't like capitalists. They're and they're the ones that are educating people. What's the core of that uh, anger at business? Do you think from intellectuals? I think. There's, you know, it's not, I think there's different factors, yeah. but the, the one most powerful one is, look, the intellectuals were always the smartest people when they went to school, right? They're the ones that went on and got PhDs. They're the ones that um, got the top grades. Uh, and they make good livings, but they're not, they're not, in the social hierarchy of America, they're not at the top of the hierarchy, even though they're the smartest people. Uh, they tend oftentimes to be more risk averse, more security oriented, mm-hmm. get tenure and stay there. Uh, whereas a lot of the people that they didn't like when they were going through school, a lot of those people patting on the back and, and the social people that were disdained the, the, the nerds, so to speak, in school, they, they've ended up being pretty high in the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, subconsciously, I think there's just that they don't like those people. And they seem to be wealthier and seem to be have more power in the society and more status. And so I do think people underestimate the power of envy. Envy is a very powerful emotion. No, almost no one will own their own envy. And yet uh, it's very, very real. Yeah. And, and people hide behind other emotions frequently. So I think that's a real driver. Where do you stand in the social hierarchy? In a socialistic country, the intellectuals tend to be higher status. Before we continue with the Reason interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Bank on Yourself, a retirement plan alternative. Most of us have been told the only way to have enough money to retire is to put your life savings into a 401k or IRA and then bank on Wall Street. But if that were true, why do studies show the average American who follows that advice will outlive their savings by a staggering 10 years? Get the truth and discover a better way to grow and protect your money. Bank on Yourself is a proven retirement plan alternative that banks and Wall Street are desperately hoping that you never hear about. It gives you guaranteed predictable growth and retirement income. With Bank on Yourself, your plan doesn't go south whenever the markets tumble. You're also in control with Bank on Yourself. You get access to your money for any purpose with no questions asked and no government penalties or restrictions on how much money you can take or when you can take it. You also get peace of mind. You'll know the minimum guaranteed value of your retirement savings on the day you plan to tap into them and at every point along the way. Learn the secret to safely and predictably grow your wealth every single year, enjoy tax-free retirement income, and gain control of your money. Just go to bankonyourself.com slash word and they'll send you a free report about the retirement plan alternative that lets you bypass banks and Wall Street and take back control of your financial future. That's bankonyourself.com slash word, W-O-R-D, for your free report. And now, back to the Reason interview. In keeping with kind of generational interests, uh, LSD makes an appearance on page seven of your book. Um, And you talk throughout the book about different experiences with psychedelics. Um, You are, you mentioned being spiritual and kind of interested in new age uh, thinking. 
it's clear, you know, drugs are not the answer to you, but you are, you've used psychedelics. Can you talk about the, the way that psychedelics helped you kind of conceive of how you do business as well as how you live your life? Yeah. I do make a distinction between psychedelics and drugs. Okay. Um, and I think of drugs as uh, mostly things like, um, well, alcohol, mm -hmm. nicotine, um, cocaine, heroin, uh, drugs that are addicting. And, and the thing that makes psychedelics difference is they're very expansive. Mm. They're, they're, they're gateways into deeper spiritual realities. And I couldn't include all my best stories in the book because the publisher at 400 pages was kind of my limit. Otherwise, we'd be looking at a thousand page, <laughs> multiple tome. And <laughs> then I looked at my hand, man. <laughs> you could have yeah. should have seen it. But well, the first time I did LSD was when I was uh, 19 years old. And that, it wasn't a hero's dose, but it was, it, it was really powerful enough to where it knocked me off the, the path my parents had set for me. It was like, I became a seeker then. I got interested in Eastern religions. I started, I started reading Herman Hesse and Alan Watts, and uh, I began to, you know, start to meditate and, I, and do yoga. And I, I got interested in alternative spirituality because I had just figured that before then I'd been just kind of an atheist existentialist, you know, that life is meaningless. There's no purpose to life. There's no, there's no deeper spiritual reality. We're just, we're, we evolved by random chance after this big bang. And yeah. there's, you know, it's just, it's just no point to it at all. Yeah, Absolutely. You, you wrote, uh, after the LSD experience, all I was aware of was one consciousness, pure ecstatic beingness. That was the first time I yeah. actually experienced it. I ex in my life, I've experienced ego death twice, both mm -hmm. times on Can you explain LSD. what ego death is? Well, in our normal consciousness, like right now, I can distinguish between you, me, mm -hmm. these lights, these, these, these things are separate from me. There's me and then there's everything else. With an ego death, the separation disappears. There is no separation because there's no me. There's only yeah. one. You don't, you, you're not even conscious any longer of any separation that there's no the ego's not there it's not present it doesn't exist and um and that's not narcissism it's not assuming everything well, narcissism is, is the exact opposite yeah. narcissism is the belief that the ego is the only thing that exists mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. nothing else outside of the ego but this there is no ego right. in this in this state, there is only beingness. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to describe to people that are in an ego state because it's very hard for them to imagine a state where there's no I. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what isn't there any longer. And when you're in that state, you're not aware that you, there is no separation. And so it's ecstasy, there's bliss. You're just, mm -hmm. it, 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 it was a blissful experience. One, I mean, it was a terrifying to experience the ego death. Mm -hmm. Because you resist it. You don't yeah. want to die. I won't want to die. Mm -hmm. And then, it, but when you surrender and you let go, you don't, you, you're gone, but what remains is really the essence of what you how, are. How does that, uh, you, you also repeat the line throughout the book that is derived from this, uh, expand into love, don't contract into fear. Yes. How does that, how does that translate into business? Um, because a lot of people would say, okay, I get that from a, a kind of spiritual or an interpersonal level. But how, how has that affected your business life? Well, first, of course, uh, I'm not perfect at that, right? I do sometimes contract into fear. I forget. But that's a good mantra for me to remember that I can expand back into love. So in the next moment, you can choose love. And if I forget, well, I can choose in the next moment. Mm -hmm. And the next moment after that, so you're and always love. Here is kind of a, a, an understanding of the the connectedness of everything. I believe that love is sort of the essence of who we are. That's that's our that's our deepest self. The, when when the ego is gone, there is love, and uh, that you just have to remove the blocks to the presence of love. And where the blocks are, things like fear, anger, judgment, guilt, um, uh, and Ways to get back into a love's place are forgiveness, mm -hmm. openness, surrender, uh, opening the heart. Mm -hmm. These are all, so uh, my spiritual path has been one of just going deeper into love. Mm -hmm. And so how does that in business? It doesn't mean that, that 
what the ego will say is, well, that just means you're a sap. Yeah. People don't take advantage of you. You're just gonna, you're just gonna, everybody that asks you for a dollar is gonna give it to them. And so like, that's what they think love is. Love is not guilt. Love is not, uh, uh, not being conscious. In fact, it's the opposite. You're, you're hyper conscious. You, you're seeing people as they are. You, you, it doesn't mean that you will, um, let people take advantage yeah. of you. It just means that you have an open heart and you see that person and beneath their ego is this amazing being yeah. that um, uh, I sometimes play this game where if I'm with a really angry, judgmental person it's, and it's hard to try to love that person, the game is, can I maintain my presence and my own open heart enough to be able to kind of get that candle lit a little bit in mm. them? Or will they take me to back down into contraction and fear and anger like that son of a bitch? Uh, so. Sometimes I lose the game and sometimes I win. I've gamified it. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's interesting because there's a, a lot of really interesting business showdowns throughout the book. So yeah. it's, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating to think about it in those terms. When you talk about being conscious, one of the things you're best known for is espousing what you call conscious capitalism, which, you know, arguably is more controversial among, you know, people who call themselves hardcore capitalists. Um, in reason, this was back in 2003. We ran a debate between you, Milton Friedman, one of your heroes, and T.J. Rogers, the former CEO of Cypress Semiconductor, and you were starting to sketch out what became conscious capitalism. Can you explain what conscious capitalism is? And I mean, does that also fit into the difference between kind of the greatest generation and the boomer generation or a scarcity mindset and an abundance mindset? It, it fits into my uh, philosophy of integralism, yeah. that you have modernism, you have progressivism and you have integralism as the developmental model. But I do see, I'm going to explain conscious yeah. capitalism, but I'm going to say as a preface that the vision of conscious capitalism that I, the book I wrote with Raj Sisodia, that's pretty much under attack from two fronts. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, we have traditional capitalists who see this as, uh, as a way to take power and money away from the owners. Mm -hmm. And insofar as I, t I totally agree with them, the owners need to control, the investors and owners need to control business. So let's just state that right from the beginning. I already agree with but the traditional capitalists. But when you say stakeholders, I can see people like kind of traditional people it's, clench up. Here's the thing. If you think of conscious capitalism as not an economic system, mm -hmm. not as a governance system, it's simply a management philosophy. This is the best way to manage your business. If your goal is to, when I, when I debate uh, libertarians or, or people that are, want to just or argue that shareholder capitalism is that maximizing shareholder value is really the only purpose yeah. of business, this is where we get, we get confused or where we get separate. Because if you think of it as a management philosophy, we don't have any contradiction mm -hmm. because this is the best way to maximize long-term shareholder value because it's a management philosophy. It's not a governance system. Yeah. And so the enemies of capitalism are trying to weaponize conscious capitalism and stakeholder theory to take control away from the investors. That is not conscious capitalism. It is a management philosophy. Yeah. It's just recognizing what I talked about earlier, that we do have these stakeholders. There are customers, they're employees, they're investors, mm -hmm. they're suppliers. They all have a stake in the business. Does that mean they're all equally valuable, that they right. should have each a vote? Yeah. on how the money and the profits are distributed? No. It just means they're interdependent. And you can, to manage your business, to optimize it in the long run, to the highest level, you have to take them into account. Mm -hmm. If you try to screw your employees, you're going to get labor unions. If you cheat your suppliers, you're going to end up having blowback situations where they might drop you or they'll give your competitors better deals. Um all of the stakeholders matter. They're all important. They're not all equal. Right. The, the most important stakeholders are, I'd argue, the customers. No customers, no business. And then secondly, the investors are next, right? Mm -hmm. They get paid last after all the other stakeholders have been paid. They only get the, re re the residues that are left over after all the other bills are paid. Um, they have to have control or there won't be any residues. Mm -hmm. All the money will be redistributed by other stakeholders. This is one of the challenges you see in the consumer co-op movement. Uh, Rightly understood, they need profit in a consumer co-op as much as, uh, as any for-profit business does. They have stakeholders as well. But if, if you get into an ideology that food for profit uh, 
I mean, I mean, uh, food for people, not for right. profit. Then you're going to end up with no profits. And right. then how do you how do you expand? How do you repair your equipment? How do you grow? You, profits are necessary, even for co-ops. So until you understand the interdependencies, you're not going to manage your business in an optimum way. That's what Milton Friedman understood. My disagreement with Milton was really about branding and marketing. Mm-hmm. I thought capitalism was always the enemies of capitalism, the Marxists and the socialists, were always they were always uh, caricaturizing it as a bunch of greedy bastards. Yeah. All they care about is money, and they cheat. They exploit yeah. their workers. They cheat their customers. They rip off their suppliers. These are highly unethical people, and they should not be in control of these big corporations. We should be in control of the corporations, you know, because we think about the collective common good. Um, so I s- naturally sympathize with the traditional capitalists in this argument because I don't want conscious capitalism weaponized to take down capitalism. Right. Uh, it's that, so it's, once you understand it's a management yeah. philosophy and not a governance system, a lot of these contradictions go away. The grocery business uh, is, you know, historically very unionized. Uh, Whole Foods has generally uh, withstood attempts at unionization. You talk in particular about the first successful attempt to unionize a uh, Whole Foods store. I think it was in the early 2000s in yep. Madison, Wisconsin. Yep. What happened there and how did the conclusion of that kind of prove what you were just talking about, conscious capitalism of helping, you know, in in franchising more people to get what they want out of a business without giving up control. Before I answer that question, I'm going to say just kind of a general comment because I got asked this question yesterday a couple times. And I have been put in this box of being anti-union. It's, it, and I it had somebody ask me, is there anything people say about you that bothers you? Mm-hmm. And I said, that's one of the things that bothers me. I've never been yeah. anti-union. I mean, unions are free association for people. And if they want to come together and associate if they want to strike, if they want to have somebody represent them, fantastic. It's great. I'm not anti-union. What I am is anti-closed shop where people don't have a choice any longer whether to join the union or not. And I'm anti-coercion, forcing unions on people that don't want them or companies that necessarily don't want them. So, But I fully, fully believe unions have served a historically useful position and they've, they've done many good things in our history. So I just kind of want to get that yep. out there because, but then with Whole Foods' case, the way I th- always thought about unions was in the Madison situation, it was a, a, a socialist college professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison where the store was. It was a summer project. He got his students in his class. They were, that was their, that was their project to, I want you to organize Whole Foods Market. And they did it. They, they, so they got, they got organ- full credit. Yeah. yeah. Well, the unions can make a lot of promises and companies cannot. We're restricted from making promises once a campaign is on. So the union got voted in, but uh, that ended up being a really good thing for Whole Foods because it was a wake up call for us. I was like, how can this be? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, what I began to realize is that the unions are a type of competitor. They're competing for the hearts and minds of your workers. And in this case, they won the Madison, you know, it was a close vote, but they right. won them over. And, but then that gave us, me an opportunity then. It's like, okay, this happened here, but I'm not, I'll make sure it never happens again. So, and, and how do you do that? You don't do that by hiring Pinkertons, right? And busting unions. No, what? By, by making your workplace such a happy place that nobody wants to pay union dues. By right. the time you get into to getting a union, you're angry. Yeah. You feel like you haven't been listened to, that you don't have opportunities, that you have a boss that's being an asshole. Mm-hmm. Unions are a consequence of poor management. So I went on this tour all around. I visited every store in our company and talked to the team members about And I kept asking the same question. How can we make Whole Foods the very best place to work in the United States? How can we be the best employer? And I got invaluable feedback. And we made a lot of changes in our structures. What were the and, types of things? Well, we, first of all, we... Those hippies that we started out being, they were now middle-aged and they had families and they didn't think the health care benefits were competitive. So we fixed that. Mm-hmm. Um, they were very concerned about uh, when you get Whole Foods was very decentralized and there's advantages to that. But one of the disadvantages is like we had in Madison, if you get a bad, a dictatorial local boss, mm-hmm. um, you can't always see it. So we had to put in more controls to make sure that we, we had to set up more objective measurements for our team member 
um, how satisfied people were. We need to start. Tr we need to start getting it into data and tracking mm -hmm. it. So where we where we had a problem store, we could we could fix it. But so it wouldn't escalate into a into a situation where you'd have outright rebellion like we had in Madison. So we did. We went around and we fixed a lot of. We made a lot of changes in every store in the company, but one. We had about 150 stores then. We couldn't change it in Madison because once once you put a union in, you have to negotiate strictly with the union. Right. And we try to offer the union, here's what we're doing all the rest of the company. Here's what we're going to do in healthcare mm -hmm. business. No, we don't want that. Mm -hmm. We're going to do our own thing. And so you're required by law to negotiate in good faith, which we continue to do. Meanwhile, all the stores in the company are getting better except for Madison. And then they had made so many promises to the team members the union had. And then all those organizers they left. They 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 got their A for organization, and then went on and did went on a speech circuit. A lot of them did talking about how they unionized Whole Foods. Yeah. And then a year later, almost to the day, they decert, decertified that union. It takes a full year. They can't do it before then. But the organizers were gone, and and then as soon as they decertified it, all the benefits and all the advantages that the other stores were getting, Madison got. And so ever since then, we have been. It's always been a goal of ours to be one of the best places to work in America. Mm -hmm. And Whole Foods was 20 year, consecutive years we were one of the 100 best companies to work for. Yeah. And we stopped competing for that the year Amazon bought the company. Right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Amazon before and after. You, 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 know, you, you talk about the reasons for why um, you sold the company to Amazon. Um, could you explain that? And then you know, there seems to be some pluses to being part of Amazon and some minuses. Let's discuss that a little bit. Well, um, the deal came about, people ask me, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, do you regret selling to Amazon? And the answer is, I regret the circumstances that made that our best alternative. Uh, sure, I'd rather stay independent. I just concluded that that wasn't going to be possible. And what I mean is we had shareholder activists, uh, Jana Partners, another Newberger, uh, was another activist, and they were, they weren't, they didn't want to cooperate with us. What did they want to do to the company that you weren't doing? They wanted to sell the company. Yeah, and they to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. End of story. And they said, "We know you don't want to do that, so we're going to get ready. First, we're going to take over your board, then we're going to fire you, mm -hmm. and then we're going to do what the hell we want. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it." They didn't want to. We we first approached them. Let's work together to make Whole Foods a better company. No, that's going to take too long. We don't want to do that. We're going to just take you over. You can't stop us. That they were they they had this PowerPoint presentation that they went around to Wall Street showing, which was full of inaccuracies. But uh, they wouldn't. I said, "Give me that thing." They, <laughs> they said, "No, you can't have it." Yeah. Um, so that we were in the situation. We looked at our alternatives, and, and the first alternative was maybe we should go private, take the company private. Mm -hmm. Except then. You're giving control of your business to private equity firms, uh, and you are uh, taking on a massive amount of debt. Because the way that the way that game is played is that the people that buy the company, say somebody comes up with thirteen billion dollars, mm -hmm. they're mostly borrowing it from Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. It's called a bridge loan until the company's taken over, and then they have to put up some of their own capital. But mostly, they refinance that bridge loan with the the, the, the cash flow of the company they've acquired. So you add all this debt onto Whole Foods Market's balance sheet, which means that if the company does good, then they might get a huge payday. It's a maximum leverage. Maybe they invested a billion dollars into the company and sell it for $15 billion. They may make a $14 billion profit on their billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, or not that much because they have to pay back the, the debt, but they could make a lot of money without putting much capital up. The risk is if the company doesn't do well, we can't service the debt and the company goes bankrupt. That was a huge risk. I didn't think it was worth, worth taking. Then we could have sold it. To, we wanted to sell it maybe to Warren Buffett, who's a reputation for just letting his investments alone. Whole Foods could produce a lot of cash flow for him. He just said it wasn't a good brand fit for him. He said, I own Dairy Queen. I don't think Whole Foods fits well. <laughs> <laughs> he had a good point. Yeah. So we looked at other alternatives and, we, and then fighting was an alternative. But I, we needed time to turn our company around and it was clear Jana wasn't going to give us that time. So we were going to be in this war with them. And then I thought of Amazon. I'd met Jeff Bezos the year before at a Microsoft CEO uh, conference. He and I really hit it off. He, he's one of my heroes. I think mm -hmm. Jeff's a genius. And he's, you know, 
everybody has their challenges, but he was a tremendously skilled entrepreneur. So uh, we contacted them, met with them, and we really liked each other. We talked about all the things we could do together, how we could help each other. Six weeks after that first meeting, we had signed a deal. And uh, so <clears throat> now pluses and minuses. The pluses were, they stand out, they were huge. Because we needed to, we needed to combat the, the the narrative about whole paycheck. Mm -hmm. Whole Foods was getting more competition. We were we were seeing our sales begin to level off. Our comps mm -hmm. went negative. We needed to drop our prices. But as a public company, it's really hard to do that. If you're selling something for a dollar and you start selling it for ninety cents, in the short term, your sales are going to go down, mm -hmm. your profits are going to go down, and your stock price is going to go down. And if you have shareholder activists. Well, yeah. you're not you're you're going to lose your company pretty quickly, and but Amazon, they've always, and one thing I loved about them and why I wanted to work with them, they take a long term view. I mean, they really do think mm -hmm. ten years in advance. So we in the first two years, for example, we dropped our prices four times significantly. That whole paycheck narrative, I mm -hmm. very seldom hear that anymore. Yeah, you don't anymore. We used to hear it all the time. Don't hear it so much anymore. Um, so that was one big plus. Secondly. They also thought long term. They raised everybody's pay. Everybody's pay in the company got raised in the in the first six months after Amazon. They wanted to go with this fifteen dollar minimum wage back in two thousand seventeen, and then of course, if somebody was you know making fifteen dollars already, you got to up. Mm -hmm. Everybody got a pay increase. Yeah. Again, long, thinking really long term, and that we became less profitable when that happened, and we became less profitable when we lowered prices. They were thinking long term. It was great, and then. Two other things that Amazon really helped us with. Um, technology. I mean, we were not a uh, uh, technologically savvy company. And that really came into play. Uh, it's lots of little ways, AWS and other things that's helped us out. But when the pandemic came, when COVID hit, and we went to this delivery system and people were scared to come into the stores, Whole Foods, we, we couldn't have done that. Trader Joe's never did delivery. I mean, we weren't really scaled up to do it. And uh, Amazon invested huge amounts and of it, money. It's amazing. I know when I go to Whole Foods, I pay with the palm of my hand. Yeah, you that's know, a great scanner. That, that's, like, that, yeah. Exactly. That's, yeah. a, that's an Amazon technology. And there's, there's been all kinds of things you can't see right. on the technology front that Whole Foods was not capable of but doing. But then you, you talk about, you know, that the ethos of decentralization and kind of shop individual store-based innovation is kind yeah. of a victim, right? It of, is. Of Amazon. Can we, you talk about that? Well, it, Amazon's blamed for all of that unfairly. Whole Foods was already beginning to centralize mm -hmm. certain things from a technology standpoint, trying to get more efficiencies. Uh, centralization has a promise of lower cost because you're more efficient, and the trade off is less innovation. You don't have as much innovations occurring on a local and regional level. And so we were trying to thread the needle on that one to get the right balance. COVID accelerated that centralization. And as I say in the book, we kept hiring MBAs and they were all centralizers. So I didn't do as good a job fighting against it as I did in the early days. And so, but, so, but Amazon didn't discourage that, let's put it that way. They were, they were in favor of that. So um, I'd say that's a, that's a negative. But on balance, you know, to me, it's... I always say that if I had to go do it over again, I'd have made the same choice. I'll always wonder, Nick, to the day I die, what if we'd fought? Hmm. Could, we have, could we have bested Jana? Did I, have a, did I lose my nerve? Did I chicken out? Um, when I think back on it, you know, my, my job was to come up with the best solution for every one of the stakeholders. How can, and this was a good thing. Our, customer, our customers got lower prices. Our team members got higher yeah. wages. Our suppliers continued to do business with us. Our investors made a huge profit on the sale. So the government got lots of taxes. Yeah. So well, that will hold that one against you. But you know, the other thing, and you couldn't have seen this, but during the pandemic, the, the mix of, have, of Whole Foods groceries and Amazon's delivery capability yes. was a game changer. I mean, however terrible the pandemic was, it would have been you know, 25, 50% worse, right, without that. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, all in all, Amazon and Whole Foods has been, is, is it a perfect marriage? Right. No, it's not perfect. There are some, cult, there are some cultural differences. But I want to mention that Amazon never really tried to change our culture at Whole Foods. But they are like, a, think of them as like this giant sun with a huge gravitational pull. 
So it's not so much that they're forcing us to change, but we are in orbit around them, and they and their culture is powerful, and it did influence mm-hmm. Whole Foods in ways that um, if we hadn't been in their gravitational pull, we wouldn't have been influenced by it. You are now working uh, on a uh, uh, the new venture is Love Life. Right. Let's talk about this and how this is. In the book, you talk a lot about evolution, yeah. you know, both on the individual level as well as on a kind of cultural, civilizational level. <laughs> what is love life and how does that represent the next stage for you? Well, for me, uh, love life is sort of a continuation of my own, what I think of as my own higher purpose in life, mm-hmm. in which my higher, you know, Whole Foods' higher purpose is to nourish people on the planet. And it's done that through food and having a good, good healthy work culture and, and the philanthropy we do and whatnot. I see love life as kind of a continuation of that. But with Whole Foods, it was just primarily healthy food. Mm-hmm. With love life, uh, we're creating what I, I, we're going to create a chain of large one stop holistic health membership clubs. Let me explain what that means. So we'll have, we're going to open our very first location up in uh, LA area, El Segundo, on July 9th. And so that centers in Old Best Buy. It happens to be located next to one of Whole Foods Market's highest volume stores. One of the advantages I have, I know all of Whole Foods' <laughs> best locations. Right. And that's a good place for a love life yeah. to go, good overlap in customers. So uh, we will have a healthy restaurant. We will have a uh, state-of-the-art fitness center and gym. We'll have yoga and Pilates. We will have um, a really nice spa with mm-hmm. massage, facials, all kinds of uh, wraps, things like that, but also recovery things like uh, hyperbaric oxygen chamber, cold plunge, infrared saunas, uh, cryotherapy. Um, We'll also have fun and play. We'll have pickleball courts. Mm -hmm. We will be doing, um, and we'll have a medical center. And so I always try to get people to understand how it's different. Uh, These are medical doctors, but they're trained not just in prescribing drugs, but they are also functional doctors, integrative doctors. They're integrative, meaning they use East and West. So we'll be doing Ayurvedic, traditional Chinese, uh, acupuncture. We will be having physical therapy. Uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that it's more difficult to explain, but since I've gone this far mm-hmm. with you in this dialogue, I'll throw this out. I also don't want to just heal the body. I really do want to help people to become the healthiest version of themselves. People go see a doctor when they're sick. And our goal is to get, let's take somebody like you. We, if you joined Love Life, we'd want you to take a battery of tests and start getting you to wear a wearable. It's like you have mm-hmm. an Apple Watch on now. We want to start tracking where your health is and then working with you, a doctor and a wellness coach, mm-hmm. a health coach, will work with you to kind of, kind of create a plan for Nick Gillespie right. to help you in whatever areas you might need help to optimize your health, extend your health span, extend how your lifespan. What does that cost? Um, it's, you can just get a fitness uh, membership. That's going to be $300 a month. Mm-hmm. And if you want to add on, the medical part of that will be an add-on for an additional $450. And month. will insurance cover that? Insurance or will not cover, uh, the insurance will cover some of it. It'll, ins- it'll, it'll cover like the testing part. Right. When we're trying to find, you get in your blood and, 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 mm-hmm. and, and getting your baseline established. And then we can, we're can. we creating amazing technology where you're going to have a platform. One of the things that lacks in our society today is you, d- you do tests, you see doctors, and you don't, you don't, it's not yours anymore. The right. doctor has it. Here, it's going to be yours. You're going to own it. We're going to have a platform for you. You can access it with your app. You can share it with anybody you want to. Your doctor, your wellness coach will work with it on it. Um, but we're also going to be, and this is, we're going to be doing, we're also going to be doing a psychological work and we're also going to be doing spiritual work. So we will have meditation classes. We will do breath work. When psychedelic therapy is legal, right? Well, I mean, by that I mean psilocybin and uh, MDMA in a therapeutic setting, which I'm a huge proponent of because of the success it's had scientifically with PTSD, we will be offering that at Love Life as well. I really want the whole yeah. person. That's something Whole Foods couldn't do. Love is, Life can do it. Is that a regulatory nightmare? I mean, is it hard to find places that are willing to kind of allow all that to be happening? <laughs> only only on that psych- <clears throat> only that psychedelic therapy, which is not legal yeah. except in Oregon and Colorado. At this right. Point. But the other stuff, like, people are okay with that. 
or, or you haven't found it difficult? There's no regulatory problems. Well, these are medical doctors. We're not, yeah. They're not practicing medicine without a license. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we do want to create this community of people. I yeah. think that, uh, you know, Howard Schultz at Starbucks used to talk about Starbucks being a third place. That's not really true much anymore because right. of order ahead. It's yeah. kind of a, it's kind of an assembly line. And now. in a lot of places, they've taken the chairs out because homeless people congregate. Yes. And things like, I mean, it's well, not what it was. Love Life is going to be a third place for our members. We're going to want. We, that's why I call it a membership club. Right. We're, you know, between we're going to have all these pickleball activities, but we'll have fitness. We're going to have. We're going to have. We're going to do retreats there. We'll have bring people from out of town, and we mm -hmm. maybe we'll do a breathwork retreat, for example. Um, and meditation classes. And we really want to create a community of people that are dedicated to becoming the healthiest, best version of themselves. And you you believe you are, or you're working to be the healthiest version of yourself. Yes. You are currently 70? Is yes. that right? Okay, but what is your, um, you know, that's your chronological age. How do you look at your kind of like molecular age? And You know, it's very interesting. One of the tests that we do uh, is something that it measures your rate of methylation, and it can kind of tell you your biological age and compare it to your to your chronological age. What is methylation? It's the uh, good question. I'm not exactly sure I can do it and a, a, explain that in a way, but it 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 does reflect the rate of your of your aging. Okay. So uh, anyway, the test for me showed that um, my cellular age was. 65. Mm -hmm. So I was five years younger than my chronological age. But my metabolic age, the, 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 my hormones, mm -hmm. the way I deal with blood sugar, the way I deal with my testosterone and mm -hmm. all, and uh, uh, the way my, the health of my metabolic was only 40.5. Wow. Almost 30 years younger. So my diet and lifestyle has yeah. been working for me. And you believe, uh, you one of the most interesting uh, kind of themes in the book is how you went from being vegetarian, or mostly vegetarian to vegetarian to vegan. And uh, you believe strongly that diet and exercise are like the big swing things in most people's health. I, um, what, <clears throat> yeah, what percentage of a person's health would you say is directly related to diet and exercise? I do think there are other factors. Yeah. So Let's not, of course, we know there's a genetic factor. Mm -hmm. I do think that's overrated in terms yeah. of people's longevity and health, but it can't be completely discounted. Um, but besides those two, there's other, there are other qualities. Sleep. Mm. I mean, um, uh, I know you stopped drinking a long time ago. I stopped two and a half <laughs> years ago because of my Apple Watch. Yeah. Because I did these experiments, and anytime I had any alcohol at all, my deep sleep completely disappeared. I mm -hmm. got zero, none. And then I wouldn't drink and I'd get two, three, four hours of deep yeah. sleep. So it became down to kind of like, hmm, do I want to drink tonight or sleep? Yeah. And it turns out almost all the time, it's I'd rather get a good night's sleep. So I feel good the next day, yeah. right? So sleep's important. Exercise is important. How you manage stress is important. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can either kind of... Uh, some people just freak out with stress and they're anxious all the time. Anxiety kind of rips up our health. And if you're angry and upset, you're, you're aging yourself. Mm -hmm. So people have got, that's why something like meditation mm -hmm. or yoga or anything that helps you relax mm -hmm. is very good for our, our health and longevity. Do you expect that the people coming to this, are they going to be boomers or are they going to be zoomers? It's a very interesting question. So, we actually, I didn't go into the details on our, on, our, on our health. We actually have four ways people can go on the, on the medical side. One is what we're calling the HEAL route. So if you are obese, type 2 diabetic, we, we do testing and we find out, oh my gosh, you, know, you, you, you don't know this, but you're actually, you're actually type 2 diabetic. Mm -hmm. And good news is we can heal that. Or that people have autoimmune diseases, maybe they have heart disease. There are all kinds of chronic, autoimmune diseases, all kinds of chronic diseases. They may want to be on our HEAL path. Then, then we have what we call a max performance path. Think, think 20s, early 30s, where you're just, you just want to go for the burn. You want to, you want to be, the, you want to, you're out there trying to, you're just a driver trying to you know, build your career, be as strong as yeah. you can possibly be. We have a, we have a plan for that. Uh, they're all be customized plan, but that's a path you can mm -hmm. go down. And then we have what we call the longevity option. This is going to appeal to boomers. And now increasingly Xers mm -hmm. who want, you know, who are beginning to have, 
their children are growing up, they're starting to have grandchildren. Yeah. They're thinking, you know, I kind of like living. Yeah. I, I like to hang around and without without chronic diseases. And then we, finally, we have a concierge program. Yeah. If you want to just do, if you want medical care, 365, 7, yeah. 24 7, we've got that too. Um, I, as a final point, you talk at one point about how um, capitalism is an infinite game. Yes. Um, can you explain what that means? An infinite an infinite game, first you got to dis distinguish between a finite game and infinite game. Let's take uh, uh, my favorite sport, basketball. Yeah. It's, basketball has a set of rules. It has a certain amount of time you're going to play the game. And then you're going you're to play against opponents. You're going to have a winner and you're going to have a loser. And the game ends. It's a finite game. An infinite game is a game where the players make come and go. Mm. Um, I've left Whole Foods. I'd like to think Whole Foods will be an infinite game. It may not be, but mm. right now it's outlived its, or it's out, hadn't outlived me yet, but it has, um, the, the, the founders left after yeah. 44 years and it's still going strong and probably will be for the foreseeable future. Uh, the players can come and go. Mm. Uh, the rules may change or evolve over time, but the business adapts to it. Mm. And, and, it, and so it continues to trade and exist. Capitalism itself, life is an infinite game. DNA, we're, we're replaceable. The DNA, we, you, you've, you've got, you've reproduced. Mm -hmm. And if your son has a grandchild, um, or more, then your DNA goes on to other generations. Um, DNA is continuing to replicate. So life is kind of an infinite game, um, or it intends to be. Well, so is capitalism. Capitalism is an infinite game because, uh, think about, uh, Capitalism and the the, J, the John D. Rockefellers and the An, Andre Carnegies, the, you know, they're the Andrew Mellons, they're they're gone, and our someday that Jeff Bezos is Elon Musk and, and Bill Gates and, and Steve Jobs is gone. So the players come and go, but the game of capitalism continues. It's an infinite game, and it's an infinite game of value creation. If we can, if we can, science is an infinite game. If we can. If we can continue to let science and reason operate, think about in the in, we actually in the when when you had Germany and and uh, uh, the Soviet Union and China, they actually wouldn't allow certain truths to happen in science because they were they were they were bourgeoisie, they were counter revolutionary, they were suppressed. So science itself can be repressed. The quest for knowledge and truth. If we allow science uh, to continue to operate and we allow a reasonable amount of economic freedom, then the capitalism game hmm. can continue to create greater and greater and greater prosperity, knowledge, uh, human flourishing. Human flourishing has unlimited potential, if, but it, it is a game that could be destroyed. So I, we want it to be an infinite game, but we're at risk that maybe, uh, hopefully not in our lifetimes, it may, not, may become something less. All right, we're going to leave it there. I've been talking with John Mackey, the co-founder and former CEO of Whole Foods Market, who's now heading up Love Life. And the book is The Whole Story, Adventures in Love, Life, and Capitalism. John, thanks for talking. Thanks for having me on, Nick. <laughs>